Hello there, friend. Greetings. I'm glad you're listening to this update. And I will share a very useful tip for you today. Before I tell you about that, I want to ask for your help. Are you one who made a New Year's resolution last year to read the whole Bible? Well, how is that going for you? Would you be willing to share a word of testimony from your year reading through the Bible to encourage others? If so, use the voice memo app on your cell phone to record your message. You might share a verse that meant a lot to you this year, or share some way God used his word in your life. I'll post your comments, your recordings, at the dailybiblereading.info website. I might put them out in a promotional podcast before the end of the year, and I'll tell you how to send your audio file to me at the end of this episode. If you are one of those who made a decision a year ago and have kept up your reading since January the 1st, you know that we're now in the big prophecy binge reading time at the end of the year, reading Minor Prophets, Isaiah, and Revelation. The possibility of seeing correspondences between your three daily readings goes up to about 95%. Some people find the prophetic genre difficult. Recently, I had a conversation with one of our church's elders. He had undertaken to do a thorough study through the book of Jeremiah and found it very difficult. More than that, he complained about his frustration in understanding the book of Revelation. I want to offer a little help in this area that I rediscovered recently. Here's the tip I mentioned. It's Dr. Bob Utley's Free Bible Commentary. Note the word free. The link for this is in the episode notes, but predictably it's pretty easy, so I'll read it to you. Free Bible Commentary spelled as one word, dot org. Free Bible Commentary dot org. What you get in Dr. Utley's commentary is expert information that is gleaned from a lifetime of research. Bob Utley has dedicated himself to making a high-quality commentary on every book of the Bible. His work is scholarly, yet written so that it's easy to understand. There are introductions. There are special topics that he covers— It's easy to find what you're looking for because he goes through verse by verse and the words that he's talking about are bolded. He has information on nearly every important word in every verse. So, in view of our current prophecy reading binge, I would like to share some thoughts on the prophetic genre, which is also called the apocalyptic genre. Many of us recently read the book of Daniel. You may recall that chapter 11 is filled with incredible details prophesied to Daniel by an awesome angelic messenger. I'm not going to go into any of the details now. What I will do is give you some introductory material from Bob Utley's commentary on Daniel 11. I'm just going to summarize some general points about the prophetic genre that happens to be in the introduction to that chapter. And Bob Utley was quoting from a book by D. Brent Sandy, which is called Plowshares and Pruning Hooks, Rethinking the Language of Biblical Prophecy and Apocalyptic. I have quoted this section completely in my episode notes, and I'm just going to be reading some little parts of it and summarizing. What makes biblical prophecy problematic? Hard to understand. Well, it's emotional language. 
What do we do when we use emotional language? Well, we can use hyperbole, that is, exaggeration. A prophet's intent may be to express emotion more than exactness. Furthermore, in this introduction, Mr. Sandy says, if we fail to grasp the inherent metaphorical nature of language, we fail to understand prophecy. So, in prophecy, we're going to see a lot of figures of speech, a lot of metaphors that must be interpreted as metaphors, not as literal details. So the details that we read in chapter 11 of Daniel, for instance, may be there to give the account more emotive power. So therefore, in some ways, it's kind of a futile task to determine the significance of every little detail in apocalyptic visions. To read the apocalypse with a microscope, striving to decipher the significance of the most minute detail, defrauds the genre of its intended function. So we don't read prophecy with a microscope. We're looking for the general flow. So here are a couple of good ways to express that. Prophecy demonstrates a pattern of translucence rather than transparency. The intent of prophecy is not to give specific information about the future. Prophecy is abounding in poetry, as we'll see in the Minor Prophets and Isaiah, and that should suggest that the correct understanding of prophetic poetry is often not possible until after the fulfillment. In fact, later on, he says, biblical prophecies were generally not understood before they were fulfilled. I think of the example in Isaiah 7, 14, about a virgin will conceive and bear a son. There's no way anybody would have figured out that this was supposed to be about Jesus until Matthew writes about that much later. The writer, quoted by Bob Utley, also gives a wonderful metaphor for uh, what prophecy is like in saying that it is a stained glass window, not a crystal ball. The function of the prophet's language was to draw attention to basic ideas about the future, not to reveal precisely what will happen and when it will happen. So that's my uh, summation about some important information quoted by Bob Butley in his commentary, quoted from a book by D. Brent Sandy entitled Plowshares and Pruning Hooks. It was actually my Bible translation team in Indonesia who reintroduced me to the Free Bible Commentary series earlier this year. They described the commentary like this, Utley doesn't promote only his own interpretation of the passage. Instead, he equips the reader with all the information needed to weigh the strengths and weaknesses of differing opinions, giving you the tools needed to make good interpretive decisions. My wife, Gail, has been leading two groups of women at our church every week in studying Isaiah chapter 40 through 66. It used to be that I would find post-it notes on the dining room table with questions for me to answer. But ever since I showed her Bob Utley's commentary, I seldom find post-it notes on the breakfast table. So now to let Bob Utley help us with the book of Revelation that many of us are reading right now, I would like to read a couple of paragraphs from his introduction to that book. This is Dr. Utley speaking. 
Most of my adult academic or theological life, I have had the presupposition that those who believe the Bible take it literally, and that is surely true for historical narrative. However, it has become more and more obvious to me that to take prophecy, poetry, parables, and apocalyptic literature literally is to miss the point of the inspired text. The author's intent, not literalness, is the key to a proper understanding of the Bible. To make the Bible say more than the original writer intended is as dangerous and misleading as to interpret it in such a way as to make it say less than was intended by the original inspired writer. The focus must be on the larger context, the historical setting, the intention the author expressed in the text itself, and in his choice of genre. Genre is a literary contract between the author and the reader. To miss this clue will surely lead to misinterpretation. The book of Revelation is surely true, but not historical narrative. It is not meant to be taken literally. The genre itself is screaming this point to us if we will only hear it. This does not mean that it is not inspired or not true. It is just figurative, cryptic, symbolic, metaphorical, and imaginative. The first century Jews and Christians were familiar with this type of literature, but we are not. The Christian symbolism in The Lord of the Rings or The Chronicles of Narnia might possibly be modern parallels for us. After reading that paragraph, I'm reminded of uh, an elder that I remember fondly from before in another town a long time ago who said, So many things in Revelation are symbolic. How come people decide that 1,000 years has to be literal? Quoting one more paragraph from Bob Utley. These apocalyptic works were never presented orally. They were always written. They are highly structured literary works. The structure is crucial to a proper interpretation. A major part of the planned structure of the book of Revelation is seven literary units, which parallel each other to some extent. For example, there's the section of seven seals, and then seven trumpets, and then seven bowls. With each cycle, the judgment increases. In the case of the seven seals, one-fourth of the world or the objects are being destroyed. In the case of the trumpets, one-third is destroyed. In the case of the bowls, ah, total destruction. Within each literary unit, the second coming of Christ or some eschatological event occurs. And he lists these eschatological events, the end times events, and I will not read them, but they're in the episode notes. This shows that the book of Revelation is not chronologically sequential, but a drama in several acts which foresees the same period of time over and over again, expressed in progressively violent Old Testament judgment motifs. Well, that is a complicated paragraph to read, but there's a lot of information in Bob Utley's commentary that is wonderful and well worth reading. There's so very much more that I could share from his commentary on Revelation. I'm going to have 
my browser set with a, a tab open to the Minor Prophets and also another tab open to Revelation as I go through at the end of this year. Here again in the episode notes is a link to Bob Utley's commentary on Revelation. Once again, if you've been blessed by reading the Digging Deeper Daily Reading Plan this year, no matter where you are in the year's readings, please share your blessings by recording a voice memo for me. This request is for anyone who's been following the Digging Deeper Daily Plan no matter if you've been reading in a Bible or listening to the daily podcasts. To send your audio file to me, please use the contact button at dailybiblereading.info. That brings up a form where you will give me your email address and you can write a short message saying that you want to send the file to me. So you won't be able to attach your file in that form. But I will reply to you swiftly, and then you will be able to send your audio file to me as a reply to that message. So now in this month of December, I wish you a very Merry Christmas. And Gail and I say to you, may the Lord bless you real good.